maybe become part of the recording made available to the public. I hope everyone understands that. The first item on the uh, agenda is the acceptance of the minutes. Is there a motion? I'll make a motion make to approve. Second? No, second. All right, motion has been made and properly seconded. All those in favor say aye. 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 Motion passed. Uh, I can't I can't see the agenda, but I think the next item on the agenda is uh, reviewing the uh, financials uh, that were sent out yesterday. Is that correct? Yeah, you should have Bill. I don't know if he'll put it up or um, but you should have the October flash report that was sent out in addition to uh, September. Um, you should have also gotten the uh, updated uh, total fund AUM figure uh, as of yesterday. Yeah. Um, and then there was a couple notes just about uh, how much cash and, uh, you know, upcoming cash raise in December, or January um, to fund future benefit payments. Uh, so with that, um, I'll let Floyd um, and or Alex uh, jump into the review and market uh, commentary. Floyd, why don't you go ahead first? No, pro no problem. Hey, everybody. Um, yes, uh, Alex is right. I did have to make sure that my bow tie was tied this time. Um, so, you know, sorry for that delay. In regards to kind of what's been going on in the market, if you think about it, this year has definitely been a volatile year. Even if you think about the third quarter, third quarter, uh, July and August were up. You saw a massive downward trend in September. Now in October, you see an upward trend. Uh, if you're looking at it from October, the S&P corrected 8.5%. Um, if you go down the cap size, uh, small caps did 11%. The most interesting thing to note is that even year to date, um, small caps have not gone at, down as much as large caps. Small caps have actually done a lot better. So if you think about your portfolio and you think about that weighting, uh, that's been a positive within there. International didn't do as hot. Um, developed bounced back during the, you know, during the, the month of October. Developed was up about 5.38% uh, if you're looking at the EFI. Uh, emerging markets was down. Reason why emerging markets down, if you're thinking about what's going on with China, China being close to 40% of emerging markets, China's headwinds are still there. Um, they seem to be having some relief going forward, but they are still there, especially when you think about from the property aspect. Fixed income, if you're looking at fixed income, where has it been? You know, it really hasn't been treasuries. It's been high yield is where you want it to be at. Um, you saw that during the month of October also. Uh, now, if you're looking at some of the diversifiers, such as your REITs and commodities, Recent commodities also did pretty okay during the month of October. Um, REITs were up about 3.38%. You had commodities are up about 2%. But you know, if you're thinking about it as uh, headwinds and what they what they're supposed to do, those two things are diversifiers. They didn't they haven't really diversified as much as most people would think throughout the year. But those are some of the elements that went on during the month of October thinking about some of the economic uh, stats that really come to bear. If you're looking at from the economic stats, the first thing would be inflation. Inflation has come down. You saw the recent print at 7.7%. Um, you're thinking about, okay, well, what are some of the things that are inputs into inflation that you need to be concerned about? You know that housing has definitely started to see cracks in regards to interest rates increases. That's actually been uh, you know, a plus, and that's going to be actually a tailwind for for um in, for inflation to come down. If you're also looking at it from that aspect, a lot of the uh, money that was spent on goods, that money is not there. It's going over to services, and even with the goods, you start to notice that a lot of things that were highly inflated, whether it's been the cars or other things, are starting to come down. One component within there that's going to be uh, definitely deflationary for the next year. It's going to be the medical portion, the medical portion, which was inflationary over the past 16 to 18 months will be deflationary going forward. Um, so if you're looking at it saying, OK, well, will we get back to target um, for inflation? And you think about the uh, Fed's target, which is about two and a half to at least two percent. I'm um, sorry, you're that two and a half to two percent for that inflation. You're not going to be there. Um, will it be lower? It definitely will be lower. Um, you know, if we take it to the interest rates, interest rates, you know, now you've already seen the Fed hike. They hiked 75 basis points. You're expecting them to hype another 50 basis points in December and then another 25. After that, it should be 
pretty much stay flat. And then from there, it's going to be more on what's going on with the economy. When we're looking at the economy real quickly, um, and I know, um, you know, this is going to be a kind of chuckles because something that we've talked about for the past couple months, you're starting to notice now within unemployment, uh, more people either stop hiring or doing layoffs. Um, and so one of the things that we've noticed, we've been at historically low unemployment. Employment probably probably needs to tick up from 3.7% um, to closer to at least about 5%. I think that will be an area that the Fed will be okay with. Um, but you are starting to know more and more layoffs, whether it's FedEx that's not doing any hirings during their busiest time of their year, uh, or Amazon letting uh, some of their people in their corporate office go, not in their warehouses, their corporate office, or even you're looking at some of the technology companies. Yes, I mean, Twitter has been one of the main the headlines, but if you're noticing Microsoft and others that are saying, hey, we're going to reduce workforce, it's there right now. That's something that we essentially needed to see to kind of say a lot of that easy money is being worked out of the system, and it will be more about uh, returns and opportunities going forward, which should bode well for active managers. Um, uh, with that, and I know I kept my comments pretty uh, pretty tight. Um, Alex, do you want to touch on anything else or a uh, board? Would you like to, uh, me to expand upon anything else going on uh, within the markets and or world? Um, Floyd, actually, could you maybe touch on um, earnings generally in the third quarter? I know that um, you know a few companies have reported stronger than expected. Um, you know, there have been trends between sectors, um, and I've you, know, you mentioned briefly. Uh, you know, the the inflation has sort of shifted away from goods to the services sector. Uh, that's on the back of demand. You know, high demand for things like travel. Uh, I think we've seen. Um, you know, it is a busy travel season, but beyond that, um, a resiliency in consumer demand for flights, uh, hotels, uh, entertainment, in that regard. Yes, you definitely seen a lot of the services start to come back. Um, those have popped. Also, if you're looking at it to where they pushed off, when you're looking at their earnings, where they pushed off some of those costs, they pushed off some of those costs over to the consumer. Uh, so you notice that the, that's the reason why the price of flights are a lot higher. It's going to stay higher going forward. Um, if you're looking at you know what you're spending at the quote unquote restaurants on a consistent basis, that's what you're seeing there. It's being essentially pushed on to the consumer. Looking at earnings as a whole, Earnings as a whole, um, slightly if if you're looking at the beats and uh, the beats, the beats are slightly trailing what they were what they were pre-COVID levels. Um, while margins do look good, margins will be the next thing that will will, will take a hit. Um, so we're expecting that. I think if you're looking at the market, the market industry as a whole is expecting that going forward. Um, that's you know an earnings uh, even now. And if you think about it in the future with some of the trends, as you see a lot more of that deglobalization happening, uh, that is going to impact margins. And that's where, you know, if you think about your quality bias uh, within your portfolio, that's where that's going to come into play. And actually will probably uh, be a very good tailwind for you guys based off the, couple, uh, based off the positioning of your portfolio. Um, if you're looking at it as a whole, it's still been all about um, all about oil and all about the energy companies uh, while others have done well. You know, even if you're looking at the banks, the banks have been kind of scattered. Um, but you'll notice that even within the banks, the lending sector, uh, despite it being interest rates being extremely high, um, people have not gone out for loans. Um, right. So banking that usually does very well in a time frame like this um, has not done as well as you would expect uh, within um, within the whole. But if you're looking at the health of companies, companies going into this period have do have a lot less leverage. Um, they do have a, a higher cash reserves, and you know even with you know recession concerns, you know you're looking at it from an aspect of you come in a lot stronger than you have usually in the past, uh, which does bode well. To Alex's point, one thing to notice about the goods portion, a lot of the goods, i.e. Target, your Walmarts, their inventories are a lot higher. Um, they're carrying that inventory. They're trying to figure out what to do with that inventory. And they're, in some respects, having to liquidate it and or hold on to it. Um, so you're seeing it that aspect. Uh, the one uh, the one thing to be cognizant of within 
the industrial space uh, would be, yes, you see defense spending that has to go up in the near future, just across the board for the countries, uh, but within industrials, and it's going to show up in a lot of other companies, is the fact that diesel, um, that diesel shortage, you are seeing it pop up here and there, that diesel does play a, a role within transportation, which essentially could be, could hamper some of the supply lines that companies do have. Uh, you haven't heard that start to creep in the news, uh, but as that creeps in the news, that might be something that will impact earnings for some of the companies over the next couple quarters. Yeah, thanks. No problem. So any other making questions any comments, or uh, regarding the, the international markets? International markets, when looking at the international markets, um, the one positive and one thing you'll notice is that international has actually done a lot better than what expected. Um, you know, energy concerns that you saw within Europe, they actually stockpiled energy during the summer. Um, it doesn't seem as if they're going to have a super cold winter, so that does bode well for them. Uh, the one thing is that, you know, the the companies as a whole have not recovered as fast as United States companies uh, through COVID. So there still is that headwind. They will have to, just like we're flirting with a recession, you know that the recession is definitely going to hit them. It'll probably hit a little bit harder than uh, than it would in the United States, um, but they'll be able to come through. Um, earnings wise, the dollar has been a headwind. It will continue to be a headwind, um, but next year, um, as interest rates increase for those countries, um, that dollar headwind should subside, which will be a tailwind for international companies going forward. Um, you know, I think if you look at us, you know, we, you know, one thing is that the the dollar has allowed us to have cheap goods. Um, the dollar being inflated has, you know, allowed companies to, you know, that are importing to the United States do a little bit better, um, but it hasn't helped them out overall. Um, but going forward, it should help them out um, with that lower dollar um, helping them as a tailwind. Thank you. No problem. Can folks see the uh, the flash now? I shared the screen. Okay, good. Um, and if you're ready to jump into that, I can uh, speak to that very briefly before we finish up. Any other questions for Floyd? or on the markets, and we can come back to that if needed. Um, this is as of the end of October. Uh, you know, Floyd noted uh, September was a particularly weak month. Uh, we saw, you know, a, a fairly strong recovery uh, in the month of October, um, you know, following, you know, clear policy set by the Fed and some, you know, clearer expectations for investors. Uh, the plan did particularly well. You can see the one month return 5.15 versus 3.83 for the benchmark. Um, you know, it, largely uh, on uh, you know asset allocation and overweight to equities. You know, modest overweight to equities, um, but also some strong performance from active management, um, which we'll get get into. Um, on a year to date basis, you can see the the plan has uh, you know done you know well to in what has been a very difficult market for pension plans. Uh, the benchmark down eight, nearly 18.5%. Uh, the plan net of fees 17.18%. Uh, so, uh, you know, adding over a percent of, of downside protection. Um, you know, it does impact the trailing one year return. Certainly, we're almost, you know, at, at that one year figure anyway for the year to date. Um, but maintaining a good spread over, over trailing periods. Um, Year to date, a lot of the outperformance uh, has come from active management. Um, you know, the plan has been, I think, modestly overweight to stocks most of the year. Um, you know, even as bonds have have also, you know, had a had a very, uh, you know, negative uh, absolute return on a, on the year to date basis. I think at least through you know September, stocks were still leading. Um, and so that, you know, had contributed to the overall volatility, but again, uh, active management uh, more than making up for that. So some of the highlights again, you know, this month, uh, um, you know, Pine Bridge continues to, uh, you know, has gotten back on track, um, you know, the normalization of, of the market, uh, their adjustment of the factors um, that they made, you know, kind of immediately following uh, the pandemic. 
uh, has helped them out. And you can see their year to date uh, downside protection doing quite well. Um, you know, Floyd mentioned the contribution of, uh, of small cap uh, or the outperformance of small cap year to date. It has contributed to the plan from an overweight standpoint, uh, but also, you know, an active management standpoint. I think Copeland was, you know, right on top of the benchmark for the month. Uh, year to date, they've done quite well, um, adding, you know, about five percentage points. Uh, and then again, the decision to use the, um, you know, higher quality uh, S&P 600 as the index component, uh, you know, instead of the Russell 2000 uh, continues to, to benefit the plan. Uh, on an international equity standpoint, um, higher component of active here. Uh, active management has struggled generally. Um, you know, the universe of active managers this year has struggled. Uh, you know, these two uh, separate accounts uh, in this fund have bucked that trend, um, particularly so this month that has helped their year to date performance. Um, uh, but both, again, adding some downside protection. Uh, if you want to move, move on to fixed income on the next page. Um, you know, a, a smaller magnitude of active outperformance, or excuse me, well, uh, you know, as to be expected, uh, you know, from fixed income in general, um, combined fixed income minus 0 0.87 versus, you know, minus 1.3 for the Barclays aggregate. Um, you know, the, the core to core plus managers, uh, and this has been the space of year to date again, where the universe of you know active core plus and core managers has somewhat struggled, being under the benchmark, closer to the benchmark. You know, you can see that's the case with um, you know Weaver Barksdale and uh, and MetLife. Um, but then the uh, you know intermediate exposure, the corporate credit exposure, and the high yield exposure um, that we get from the MetLife corporate credit. Uh, Garcia Hamilton uh, Intermediate, and then you know small exposure to, to Sky Harbor, um, which was one of the leaders in the in the high yield universe. Um, you know this this past uh, you know from what we've seen this past quarter, um, you know, you you end up with you know a good fifty basis points nearly of of outperformance uh, active from uh, from active management and allocation within fixed income. Um, so the net result, you know, a good month uh, and continues to be, a, you know, a, a good year, relatively speaking. Um, you know, we do deal with what the market gives us. You know, one positive um, when you look at, you know, history, you know, when you're, I'm looking out now intermediate and long term, you know, five years and beyond. Um, periods after, you know, periods like we've been in have historically uh, been very strong periods of very strong return in equity markets. Um, you know, that's we don't we don't always go off, off of you know past results, but again, it's valuations are very attractive right now. Um, you know, productivity uh, remains high. So again, the long-term trends for growth um uh at least you know in, in markets um uh, you know remain strong. Um the market we you know is also typically a little bit of a leading indicator. Um, you know, so again, it's we, we could be in for continued volatility in the near term, um, especially as we deal with the definition of you know when are we actually in a recession or are we? Um, Floyd mentioned we're poised, um, you know, we're poised relatively well entering whatever it is we're entering, um, and the markets again represent an attractive opportunity, you know, going out that that additional period. Um, so we're we're fairly comfortable with the positioning right now. Um, uh, the active management again, we're, you know, no, no issues with anything we see in the portfolio. Um, you know, if you want to flip ahead, uh, I don't, Chris, I don't know if you have the um, rebal available as an exhibit. Alex, <clears throat> before we leave this page, with Sky Harbor, with the exception of the last um, quarter, it seems that they they have trailed the index, and I. I can see that it's only been three years, basically, since 2018. Um, in what type of market environment can we expect 
and I'm going to just throw out the last quarter, but maybe you can use that as an instructive period. What type of market environment can we expect Sky Harbor to um, either meet or outperform their index? Um, you know, I would think it's in volatile periods um, and recessionary periods like we're seeing. Um, you know, when Sky Harbor was added, um, you know, high yield is a non-benchmark position. Um, so, you know, this is really an asset allocation decision to add high yield, um, you know, into the, you know, the blended fixed income, uh, you know, component of the plan. Um, and so we were looking to do some maybe in a less uh, risky way. So I think, you know, high, Sky Harbor holds, um, you know, less triple C and below. Um, they generally hold a higher quality portfolio, um, you know, as to what specifically has led to the outperformance. Uh, I'm not sure exactly of the high yield dynamics in, you know, volatile periods like this, um, but I know, you know, two, they pointed to 2009, um, you know, and the, you know, high yield volatility back then as a period when, you know, they significantly outperformed, you know, again, kind of owing to their quality um, bias. So uh, I, I can get a little more information on the last three no, months. Uh, no, that, that's all right. It's, I, sort I, of a, it's yeah. a risk. It's, you know, we would, we, we sort of do the same thing um, for, you know, and again, this was, we presented and, and there were several, several finalists and all, but okay. um, I think we, we skew um, towards high quality, high yield, uh, especially if there's no high yield benchmark component. Can you, okay can, you, can you explain under- can you explain what you mean by there's no high yield benchmark? And the reason I ask is then um, what's it being measured against the Bloomberg US corporate high yield? Is that not the benchmark or I, can you explain the, that to me? The, the plan benchmark for the total plan, um, you know, if you go up to the prior page, um, you know, the total fund TMI as it's shown. And actually, uh, maybe a better place to go, and I apologize, but you, know, you see the total fund TMI, that's yes. the plan benchmark. And that no, I, return, I get that. That return stream does, does not no. have a, a high yield component in it. Um, the, the weightings on that are shown actually if you go to the bottom of this, or the second to last page of this PDF. Yeah, here you go, down in the lower right, as of December 2016, the benchmark for the total plan is set with these weightings. Um, yeah, and so right. from, a, from, an, from an overall standpoint, uh, total portfolio management, um, you know, you, you could, the, the decision to add high yield is being measured against the Barclays aggregate. From an individual Sky Harbor manage, you know, to, to make sure they are doing what they're saying and, and you know, maintaining an invested portfolio in the high yield universe, we do compare Sky Harbor to um, an appropriate, you know, high yield benchmark. Um, but again, when it comes to time, you know, when you think about a manager within, you know, holistically within a portfolio, um, they are, they're doing the job that we brought them in to do, which is add high yield exposure, you know, in a, in a less risky way. I, I get um, that. I, but, I get that. Let me, let me restate the question. It's be, uh, Sky Harbor where it's listed is measured against the U.S. high yield um, benchmark, uh, but you said there's not a U.S. high yield benchmark. I'm not understanding what you're saying. No, I, no. The, I got you, Alex. Um, friend, I I I I definitely hear where both you where both of you two are going to. Um, what Alex was communicating was the fact that you know within within your portfolio and then within US, the uh, Barclays US Aggregate Bond Index. So the Barclays US, US Aggregate Bond Index um, doesn't have that quote unquote high yield component within there. Um, so because it doesn't have that high yield component within there, when you have high yield within your portfolio, um, that's, an act of, that's an act of selection for you and that's an act of play for you. So that's where he was going at, where he's saying, look at high yield, look at this manager, not just in how it's done versus the high yield index, but also how it's done versus the Barclays aggregate. Yeah, no, I get that. I, I, I think, I think I, we need to move on because you, you're assuming I'm not following what Alex is saying. I'm following exactly what Alex is saying. What I'm saying is we, we were told there's not a high yield benchmark 
but that's not the case because Billy, if you can go back to the previous page with Sky Harbor, it's being measured against the high yield index. Fran, Fran, what I said was there is no high yield component of the plan benchmark. And we can go back and read the minutes if you want, but that is what I said. Okay, so so I'll go back to my question. Sky Harbor, except for the last quarter, has continually trailed the Bloomberg U.S. corporate high yield benchmark. Is there an explanation for that? That was my initial question. Yes, they are a they are a more conservative um, allocator into the high yield space, and in you know typical. High, you know, you know, they have less triple C, which is the extreme high yield in in periods, low yield environments for the broad fixed income universe. The extreme junk end of the universe delivers a high yield, a higher yield. And that's what's been delivering the return in, in that in that component of the universe. So uh, is that when, is when, that index that is listed there? The Bloomberg U.S. corporate high yield, maybe not the most accurate benchmark to use in measuring Sky Harbor's performance? That That's really uh, the question. They're trailing well, that we benchmark. Disagree. Look, I, no, I I'm not, I mean, I'm not listening. I do, Alex, let me finish. I do not put the benchmark up here that Sky Harbor is being measured against. Okay? I, that's, that's not my choice of the benchmark. That's your choice. You're the consultant. My question is, Sky Harbor, except for the last quarter, has continually trailed the benchmark. Is this benchmark somehow not capturing what Sky Harbor does? My question is simple. Why is it trailing the benchmark that's listed there? That, that, that's all I asked. It, and I gave the answer. It's more conservative. You asked a new question. Is it the right benchmark? Yes. We don't believe in cherry picking benchmarks um, that fit a you know, a, a manager's, uh, you know, unique philosophy. Should we have cherry picked a benchmark for? Okay, we're going to have to move on, Alex, I, because quite frankly, I'm not happy with the response. No one's saying to cherry pick the benchmark. What I'm saying is there's a benchmark listed here to measure Sky Harbor against. Sky Harbor is trailing the benchmark, and all I'm being given is reasons why this benchmark somehow is not indicative or conservative enough to measure what Sky Harbor is doing. All I'm asking is, what, what, what should I be measuring Sky Harbor against? That's it. That's the question. Hey, Fran, uh, we'll, we'll definitely move on. Um, what we'll do is we'll make sure we bring some attribution um, because they might not have they might not have certain exposures to certain sectors that might have done well. So let's we'll we'll bring that to you so you have that on hand, okay? I appreciate it. Thank you. No problem. No problem, man. Any other questions on the managers before I move on to the uh, or if, if Chris, if you have it, we can bring up the current market value. Is it visible now? It should be up. No. There it is. All right. Sorry about that. So you can see here, um, you know, this is as of uh, the 15th. Um, you know, and naturally we would expect to continue recovery. Five hundred sixty-seven million three hundred fifty-two thousand nine hundred eighty dollars. Um, you know, not too much else to say other than if you want to go to the bottom. I don't know if it's visible there. Um, you know, we continue to pay benefits out of the cash and custody account. Um, Eight point eight nine million down from the over ten million we saw before. You know, I think this is historically now dipped down below the traditional carrying amount, which has been around 10 million. Uh, Chris mentioned benefit payments, uh, you know, in December and January. Um, you know, at this point, we are, you know, recommending bringing, um, you know, it, for for the next round of benefit payments. Um, you know, when that was is is done in December, I guess. Um, you know, raising about you know four million or so in cash, uh, basically enough to cover. 
um, you know, the December payments and then bring the, uh, the amount back up to the $10 million range. Uh, going forward, we would get back onto a monthly schedule of recommending draws based on uh, movement in the markets over the last month. Any questions? I think that's all that we have then. Well, thank you. Uh, are there any other questions? Is there any new business that we need to cover this morning? None, excuse me, none from me, Don. Um, I don't know if there's any from you or um, the other trustees, but none, none from me. Okay. Well, uh, if there are no additional questions, is there a motion to adjourn? I'll make the motion. I'll second, second the motion. All right. It sounds like we have a second. Uh, a motion has been made to adjourn, so this meeting is hereby adjourned. Thank you. Have a great week. Have a good Thanksgiving, Thank everyone. Thanks. Thank you. you too. Thanks, Thank everyone. You everyone.